Uh, you seem to have such a beautiful spirit. You're so positive and you make such strong connections with people. And you can tell this just from your story. Um, when you were ending your second marriage, I expected a bit of a blow personally, um, but it didn't come. And when you came out to your mother, I expected a really big blow, but it didn't come. So obviously you have a way of connecting with people. And despite everything that you've been through, you're just a beautiful spirit, it seems. So I was wondering, how do you stay positive? And especially during this time in, with COVID, like how can we all learn from your positivity? Oh, well, thanks, that's really generous. Um... Thank you. Um, I guess, I know it's like, it's something that I've picked up from my mother, you know, like, and also just sort of, you know, being in my experience, being a refugee, I, I feel like I, um, just the way I navigate life, like it's very much about, okay, well, this is a really challenging situation, but what is the universe trying to teach me through this experience? So, you know, I feel like every kind of difficult experience I've had, like, it's kind of informed uh, the really great choices I've made. And if those challenging situations had not occurred, I wouldn't be where I am today. So even, you know, the situation that we were in, like, you know, I am sort of thinking about like where my priorities lie, like what it is that I actually need to be happy in life. Um, you know, what is important to me? Like what is it that I need to work on, for example, you know, in my relationship? Um, so I feel like it's sort of uh, bringing a lot of that into focus. So yeah, that's an, just an example. Like I, I, it's, I just don't have uh, a defeatist attitude. And that is something that my mom very much, I feel embedded in us. You know, she would say things like, you know, life is tough, baby. Like move on, you know. Um, like I wish that she would have been like kinder, obviously, but um yeah, that is just how I navigate life. I feel like every challenge is, is an opportunity to become, um, it might sound cheesy, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to become like a better version of yourself. Because you're just really forced to face what it is that you're made of. And I feel like if we're not put in challenging situations, we don't really know what it is that we have accumulated our entire life to sort of uh, combat the challenges that we might face. Yes, that's true. That's, uh, I don't think everybody is capable of thinking that way, but it's very inspirational to hear you think that way. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so this was a memoir and rightly so, it felt like you were discussing your journey to self-discovery. I read somewhere that in one of your previous interviews, you mentioned having learned so much about yourself through this writing process. Is this true? And was your writing process more of a self-exploration? Did things come to light about some of the decisions that you made and the way that you are? Yeah, I just feel like, uh, you know, for most of my life, I was just kind of like running to the next thing. And um, I just felt like writing the book uh, forced me to look at myself for the first time because, you know, it was really the first opportunity I had had to sort of like sit down and really kind of like, uh, you know, explore why I had made decisions that I had made. And in order to facilitate that, you know, I had started seeing a therapist at the same time just to sort of like help me cope with a lot of issues that were coming up. So that also helped. Um, but definitely, I felt like I met for the myself for the first time and I think as a result I almost became more sympathetic towards myself uh, and easier on myself just so that uh, you know I could just sort of give myself a break and understand that you know in, there there's a reason behind uh, why I'm anxious at certain times or angry certain times there's a reason for that you know there's sort of like my past trauma that has um, that often informs my behavior. Okay, so in terms of your writing process, did you kind of like have a plan for your story or did it kind of come together as you went through the self-exploration? I had, you know, a skeleton. Um, and, you know, when I sort of started to uh, sort of like 
you know, you have to work on an outline that you have to submit to like your publisher. That's usually how it works. So they sort of have an idea of what your book is about. And while I was writing, I had like posted notes all, all over my wall. So like things that I thought I would explore in chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. And as time would go on, I would like, you know, move different posts to do like different sections because, you know, at times it just made sense uh, for things to be explored earlier. Um, and yeah, so like that kind of skeleton sort of like really helped me figure out what I needed to flesh out and, uh, you know, the kind of research I needed to really kind of expand on certain things. So, you know, whether it's having conversations with my mom to kind of really get clarity on why certain things happen or reading books or like talking to different people to really validate my memory, for example. Um, yeah, so that skeleton helped. Um, and just as I was writing through it, I think it's sort of like, you know, I, I couldn't help but sort of like think more deeply about why certain things had happened. Right. They came together really well. There were ideas that you talked about at the beginning of the book that I then had epiphanies about later on in the book. And so I thought like the placement of each, like the sequence of the events was so, it was so well put together. Um, and at the beginning of the book, you spoke about, so one of the things I was thinking about is you spoke about your mom's role um, to be a pious wife and attentive mother. And you said being a sacrificial lamb meant a, a place would be reserved for her in heaven. And it became clear later on in the book that that's something that you don't believe to be just. Um, but I think it was interesting that you still identified yourself as Muslim. So I was curious about how religion influenced you, who you are, and what it means to you to be Muslim. Right. I feel like, you know, I don't really have a choice. Like I say in the last chapter of the book, like it's kind of, um, to me, it's very much uh, my reference point. You know, it's kind of like shape the lens through which I see the world, you know, the way I treat other people. Um, but, you know, for me, that doesn't mean, that doesn't look like uh, my mother's version of Islam, which is very much that you have to, you know, obey and sacrifice your life to be, you know, entered into heaven. This is just what you have to do. Um, so our version differ. So I don't think that, you know, my refusal to accept her version of Islam makes me a bad Muslim. Um, and, you know, it was really nice to, while working through the project, like I was able to um, travel around the world and sort of validate my experiences with other queer Muslims around the world who sort of felt similarly. Um, so that sort of made me feel like, you know, I'm not the only one who feels this way. Right. Okay, so I'm just going to actually look into the chat window because I feel like other people have questions and I'm just hogging them all. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the first questions is that there are a lot of books behind you. Do you have a favorite genre or book that you would like to recommend? Uh, we have two bookshelves in our household. This is my girlfriend, so these are mostly her books. Um, I, you know, I don't really have a particular genre, um, <laughs> sorry, no, no, Put you on the spot. <laughs> well, it's just really, um, I think, uh, maybe I was writing an answer to Girly Book Club yesterday when I had to think about this, and I think it's really, um, the books I like are books that sort of open a window to a world that I don't know about, whether it's like a different time um you know sort of like a different country uh people who i really am curious about uh but the time is not something that i have any familiarity with you know like the one book that i'm reading right now um is uh sarah schulman's uh gentrification of the mind and she writes about how the aids crisis um you know is connected to the gentrification in new, in new york in the 80s and, you know, I am always kind of thinking about queer elders and I feel like, you know, I don't know who my queer elders are often. And it's something that I like kind of fantasize about sometimes, but that era probably produced a lot of people who have shaped me that I don't even know about, uh, that I could sort of 
see as uh, my career elders. Um, so yeah, just like people who kind of uh, open my when sort of like offer a window to a completely different time that's what i'm inspired by or the kind of books that i gravitate towards okay um all right so how why did you decide to write your story um well i um like originally i think you know the most obvious thing was when I even told people that I was writing a book, they just assumed that it would be like my photo project. Like that is just what would make the most sense. Um, but you know, what I was really feeling during the time I was working on the photo project is the fact that, you know, a lot of young queer Muslims I was talking to didn't really have a lot of people that they could look up to. You know, what came up a lot during my conversations was this idea of like trauma and that, you know, your experience as a career Muslim is very much informed by, you know, traumatic experiences, which obviously is true, but, you know, as a queer person, I've also had a lot of joy, I've had a lot of pleasure. And, you know, I don't, like I, you know, connected to sort of what I was saying earlier, like the things that I've been through, the really tough things, they have actually shaped who I am today. So I really wanted to sort of make it a point to sort of, um, you know, convey that through storytelling. Um, and, you know, I also sort of felt like I just wanted to understand myself better and writing this book would offer an opportunity to do that and to also like move on because like even now when I it hasn't been that long since the big book came out but sometimes when I look at the book I almost feel detached from some of the experiences because I feel like I've worked through a lot of emotions and it's almost like a different person I'm just mm -hmm. kind of like oh child you know like you've grown so much you know better now right I think it's very, I think the story is very important and I'm glad that you shared it because a lot of people are afraid to share their stories and like you're very brave and you've definitely changed the world in some way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, no problem. <coughs> so you grew up so much in this book from someone in the beginning who had to stay silent in your car rides with your family to someone who was finally able to advocate for herself at the end of the book. Um, because the focus was mostly on you and your growth, a lot of the readers at book club were curious about the other members of your family. Um, and because, I mean, we saw them change a lot too at the end. Yes. Sorry about my giant, uh, water bottle <laughs> that's okay that's all I have. no problem but we didn't get kind of that middle piece that you were missing uh, we were also missing so we're all very curious about your mom and your dad and how your relationship has changed with them and your sisters and yeah uh, your sisters were largely absent from them, so we were wondering if there was a reason for that yeah totally um it's very intentional um you know both of my sisters are public figures um, and I just felt like it's not really up to me to tell their story, you know, because I feel like they might want at some point in their lives to tell their own story. And it's not really up to me to tell their story. And, um, you know, I had talked to them about it and, you know, that is something that they preferred also. Um, so I just wanted to respect that. Um, yeah, because like, you know, my they're younger than me and my um my version of like our experience is probably very different from their version right and they have the right to tell their own story um uh, and my parents like our how's our relationship um you know we're still sort of i think we're still kind of working through it you know i feel like i'm lucky than a lot of queer muslim kids um uh, you know who are oftentimes rejected by their families that is not my experience um but i'm also like trying to figure out a way where my parents could accept me you know as my authentic self you know like i feel like understanding um me as a person who is queer uh, it makes sense to them like in sort of like a conceptual way but you know, I'll actually accepting, for example, my girlfriend uh, as like a part of their family. I like I'm working towards 
kind of like a time where that is something that I can do, right? And uh, until I sort of reach that point, I feel like there's still kind of a tension between us. Um, yeah, so that's something, that's where we're at. But like, I still feel like, you know, there's still a part of my life, I still feel their support, but um, what support, like I would love, I would love to feel supported and kind of like my full authentic self. Okay. That's uh, interesting, and it's super cool that your sisters are public figures. I had no idea, so I'm definitely going to yeah. love them. <laughs> They're awesome. Yes. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, how do you come to terms with or make peace with two cultural identities? Uh, I was raised in Canada, but have a Middle Eastern family and sometimes struggle with this. Thanks, Samra. I loved your memoir. Um, I, you know, there's still they're both still very much a part of me. I feel like, um, you know, I'd like to do like more Pakistani things than I do. Uh, but, you know, I feel like it's still like, it's so deeply uh, ingrained in like how I do things and my behavior that I feel like it's not really separate. You know, I was like talking to my partner this morning and like I accidentally, um, <laughs> like sets of the words in my conversation and I didn't even realize that I was doing it. So I feel like, like there's really no way for you to uh, separate that part of yourself. It's like so much part of who you are and how like you even interact with like, you know, like Canadian culture. How could it not be part of who you are? Right. Okay. Um, I, I really like this question because I had the same exact thought and I didn't know how to ask this question. So um, while reading the book, I couldn't shake the sense that there was much more emotion and possibly events that were emitted, omitted um, that Samar feels deeply about. Does she feel this book is an honest account or is there possibly more healing that must be done and perhaps over time she's able to write about? Yeah, but I, felt, I felt, I felt, sorry, I, I feel, I feel like you mentioned things, but then you kind of like alluded to what happened and moved on, didn't want to get into detail sometimes. Yeah. I feel like, um, you know, Roxane Gay has said this uh, about writing. It's like, you know, you just have to protect yourself, right? Like you, I feel like I only needed to give uh parts of myself that I felt were important to give people a sense of what happened. Like, I, like, I, I wonder if I know what, which part you're referring to, or uh, the person who's asking the question is referring to, but like, I didn't want my book to be trauma porn. Right. Um, so I didn't want to just sort of like talk about like all the really terrible things have happened to me and just like delve deeper and deeper into that. Like, I sort of felt like it was a, just, important for people to just to get an idea of um the kind of harm for example that might have happened to sort of understand um you know where my place in the world was and how i sort of felt um but yeah like i you know i there are certain things that i still sort of want to like really kind of um fine-tune my understanding of before i feel like uh, it's the right time for me to write about it and like in what context, right? Right. That's fair. I like that answer. Um, so what inspired your title? Uh, it actually came from, um, so my photo project, uh, one of the subjects I interviewed, um, I had gone to see them in Montreal and, you know, I was sort of talking to them about like being queer and Muslim and they had said that, you know, even though there's a recent obsession with everything that's queer Muslim, the fact of the matter is that we have always been here. It's just that the world wasn't ready for us yet. So like whenever I saw that, it gave me chills. Um, and I felt like that was the title I wanted to use for the book. Okay. Um, so then, uh, let's see, there's so many questions here. Um, in your book, you mentioned that you wanted to go back and learn what um, changed your mother 
from the woman who arranged your marriage at such a young age to now supporting you as a queer Muslim woman. Um, have you had the opportunity to learn more since publishing the book? And has your relationship changed? And I also actually have a specific question about that as well, because <laughs> the way you worded it, you said, to better understand myself, mm -hmm. I want to find out more. So I was wondering what you meant by that. I just, um, you know, I feel like I'm very much a product of my mother. You know, like, I feel like, you know, things like stuff that I'm scared about, my insecurities, I feel like they're very much kind of implanted in me by my mother. Okay. And in order for me to really understand why I'm fearful of certain things, I really need to understand, like, why my mother, you know, um, painted certain things as things to be fearful of as a result of things that she had gone through. And, you know, there's like, like it's so much, I think about this often that, you know, I'm really fortunate to have the tools at my disposal to really kind of understand um, the consequences of trauma on my personal life and how they shape my, you know, behavior. But that is not something that my parents have access to. So, you know, sometimes when I'm kind of like thinking about my, how I feel about them and certain the decisions that they had made that to change the course of my life, um, that helps me be more forgiving to sort of um, just assume that there's a lot that probably happened to them um, that they don't even have like the language to talk about, you know? Yes. Um, so I, I would say that, you know, just thinking that makes me be more forgiving towards them or if like I want them to communicate in a certain way, I think about like how, you know, like how elitist I'm being, like, I, like I just sometimes expect them to sort of like have the same, um, the same like capacity to communicate that I do, right. which is not fair. No, it's not. Yeah, I totally understand that. And that's so, that's really insightful. Okay, um, this is funny. I actually thought of this as well. Um, could you, could we see your white coat or do you have a photo of it? Because I, I, you took it with you even when you left. It. I, was a, I was a kid. That was like, that's probably thrown out like, yeah, sorry. It was like a long trench coat. Have you been asked that before? No. Uh, <laughs> I haven't, but uh, one of the people, one of the authors who blurred my book, you know, when she sent me a note, uh, it was like really loving. Uh, and she said, you know, just like she, uh, the person who um, wrote it is also a fashion designer. Okay. And uh, Claudia Day. And, uh, you know, she just, she said that description really, really like stuck with her, like the long white coat. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even know what it was, but it really stuck with me. And I felt like it was important to your identity and you took it with you when you left. And so, yeah, it stood out for me. Well, it's just like, for me, kind of symbolizes, you know, daring to take up space in the world. And it's something that I think I still try to do, um, to sort of kind of like, you know, kind of convey that I have a right to exist. Uh, and usually because I'm really quiet, um, one of the ways that I do that is through fashion. Um, yeah, because like other, I guess other ways I could do that is like be loud, but that's not comfortable to me. That is not how I prefer to take, take up space. So yeah, that is what it, that represents to me. Okay. Um, so one of our questions that came in said, I found myself thinking how brave and fearless you were in the adventures and at the same time thinking how dangerous some of your decisions were, especially when you went to foreign countries. While the play-based warrior in me revels in your exploration, the mom in me wanted to protect you. Were there situations in which you were afraid? Uh, no. You were never afraid. Things were just... You know, things were just fine. Like, it, nothing's ever happened to me. I'm just trying to think right now. Um, maybe I'm like blocking something that was really traumatic to happen. But so you, you talked know, about, you know, you kind of like left your parents one morning and yeah. and stayed with your boyfriend, and then there was a time when you left and you went 
you know, you started traveling and then you called your mom from the airport and you said you were traveling. In any of those times, did you ever have a sense of hesitation or fear? No, I just had like, you know, like adrenaline, adrenaline rushing through my body. Like, like, yeah, I'm going to do this and this is not expected of me, but like, it's just, you know, I'm going to go on an adventure and it's going to be really great. Like I've never had anything. I was never met with anything that, um, challenge my, uh, decision to take risks. In fact, I still to this day, like, I think it's a lesson that I need to remember every time I'm scared to take on a challenge that I have never been proven wrong. I've never sort of, uh, face some kind of like repercussion as a result of taking a risk or taking a challenge or to, you know, to believe it sort of, um, pushing myself. It's actually the opposite. Um, times when I have been disappointed have been times when I didn't take a risk. So no, that's really badass. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so has your family ever read your memoir? And if so, have you discussed their thoughts with them and, um, or their parts in it? Um, so before the book was published, uh, my younger sister, um, she was the closest to my mom. Um, I really wanted her to read it because, you know, she could sort of like, um, I thought she could kind of figure out whether or not certain parts about my mom, um, would make her uncomfortable. And I also just really, really wanted um, her input on how she felt like I was depicting her mom. Um, so she was one of the first readers of the final draft. Um, and there were actually a couple of parts that I ended up taking out because she felt like they would really embarrass my mother. Uh, and maybe they were too personal. So I ended up taking that, those out. Um, my parents have not read the book. My siblings have. Okay. Um, and they don't read, they can't really read English. Okay. So my siblings are really selective about the parts of the book that they translate to them. <laughs> you know, like not going to Berlin, you know, like those, those kinds of uh, stories they've left out and omitted from what they tell my parents. Okay. Um, so go, this is a different subject now, um, switching gears completely. Uh, what was your Canada Reads process for you? Congratulations, you're like one of the finalists, right? Thank you, yes. It's exciting. Thank you. Um, I actually, you know, like when I first found out about it, I didn't really know how to feel. Um, I think that's usually like my um, reaction to like hearing that I'm shortlisted for anything or nominated for anything because it's like another layer that uh, I wasn't really familiar with when I was writing the book. Like obviously I wasn't writing the book to like win awards or be shortlisted. Um, but the being um, like actually going through the experience of like being in the same room as like all the other nominees and kind of like learning about um, you know, their work and sort of like experiencing the same kind of excitement in the same room that made me really, really excited. And I'm just really um, grateful that, you know, one of the things that's coming out of this experience is that uh, the book is reaching people I would never have been able to reach, you know, yes. like, um, just because there's like a machine behind promoting all authors. So in a sense of we've already all won, because like all of us have become bestsellers, like, you know, we were being read by folks all across the country. Um, you know, I just feel like I'm just, um, my story is being shared by people who would not know about me. And, you know, sometimes it could be like another Muslim kid in like a suburb um, somewhere in Canada who would not know that my book even existed or that their experiences are also valid. So that has been really, really nice. Okay. Um, is there a particular message that you would want to give to younger people that feel that they do not have a role model or support system at this time? Um, I would say, um, sorry, there's something in my eye. I would say find, you know, find your people. If you are um, not accepted by your biological family, you know, like find a chosen family. And, you know, honestly, like, my, I consider my career elders also to be authors. 
you know, like take comfort in reading, take comfort in books, uh, because so much of what you're experiencing that you feel no one has ever experienced before, other people have, and they have written about it. So, you know, they're sort of, you can find comfort in that. You're not alone. Yeah, I'm going to be completely honest. I, I'm probably going to sound ridiculous, but I, I had no idea what queer meant before I read your book. And then I had to go and I stopped and I had to go and do some research on it and learn about it. And one of the things that really inspired me the most about it was that it's a community that kind of supports each other. And then it made sense that you said it, they're either your chosen family. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, yeah, I've, um, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like, it's pretty vast, right? The career community is very bit large. Um, but yeah, there are a couple of people who are queer who I consider to be my chosen family, yes. Uh, okay, so someone is curious about if you have any next projects in your horizon. Um, I am wrapping my head around the next book that I want to write, and it's not going to be about me. Okay. Like, I don't want to write about myself ever again. Um, I want to challenge myself by writing fiction and, you know, relationships are, um, that's something that I think about a lot, uh, like why we choose the partners we do. Um, so that's all I can say. That is kind of what I want to write about. Okay. Um, so I like to think that over time, people of our parents' generation have come to be more accepting of marginalized queers or queers in general. Do you think that that's true from your experience with the subject or at least in Canada? Uh, you mean like, like uh, parents, like our Desi parents? Is that what you mean? Well, just of our gener parents' generation. Um... I'm not sure. Yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, they, they see parents or marginalized parents, yeah. Um, I mean, I can only speak to my experience, right? Um, yes. I feel like my parents are kind of a different breed. Um, they, they just like genuinely just want me to be happy after everything that I've gone through. So I feel like that is why they feel like they have to accept me. Right. Um, no, I guess what I was asking was because you you travel the world and you document this. So I'm just I wondering if like you're seeing a change. Um, not necessarily in like parents of people who I've interviewed because, you know, I feel like oftentimes that is a problem that they're rejected by their own families and people they love. So that hasn't been my experience. Okay. Um, <laughs> But like in my personal experience, which I can speak to, I would say, yeah, there's definitely, you know, an acceptance, a level of acceptance. There's curiosity, you know, like my mom asks a lot of questions. Um, she wants to, you know, get to know my partner. Um, so yeah, I think there is a change definitely within my parents. And I think that's a result of, you know, all the siblings like educating them and kind of like taking a path that they, not taking a path that they chose for us. So I think when they have like four examples of why their way of thinking did not work, they are forced to sort of like recess what they think is important in life, right? So, right. yeah. Okay, someone's asking um, how you feel about going back to Pakistan after the book was published? Uh, I, I don't think I can. <laughs> No, you know, I, I don't know. I actually don't feel safe. I don't feel safe. I would love to, but I don't think that's an option for me. Okay. Um, okay. So I think that's the end of my questions, but it was really nice chatting with you. Erin, did you want to add something? Um, just that, that question was um, asked by the last one you asked was asked by a I'm going to do it again. Afrina. 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 <laughs> and she said she agreed because she is actually from Pakistan. So yeah. That's too bad. Okay. Like, uh, I've never been there, but I, I mean, I, I wouldn't imagine it would be safe. Yeah. I just feel like, you know, maybe before I had written the book, I could have, but like, you know, it's like, I have a Wikipedia page that says that I'm queer. Like, it's like really easy to find out that I'm a queer person, right? Does that, does that make you sad? Because you did say at the end of your book that you wanted, to, you considered going back. 
Yeah. I mean, it does make me sad. I probably don't allow myself to think about it and get sad. And like, I, I feel like oftentimes when things are not available to me, I, uh, I just tell myself, oh, whatever, like, I don't really want it anyway. But you know, if I sit down and think about it, I probably do. And I'm sure that, you know, it will make me really sad to mm -hmm. sort of like really process that. But you know, I feel like, like, what's my other option? Like not, not speaking my truth, like not living my life, which I would never do. Right. You have to imagine that you've helped so many more people this way than, um, than I mean, well. And not having you. written your book, yeah. yeah. No, you definitely have. Thank you. Um, one thing that came up, and we did, I did a lot of meetings all over the world, and it was so interesting to see the different points of view as I circled the globe um, virtually. <laughs> um, but one thing that came up is how anything, how, how we affect change and how important it is that books like, like yours are written because we don't get anywhere until people speak out and say, I am different and this needs to change. And we saw Catholicism change. And so it's really, uh, and it, it, it's so important that like groups like ours read your book. So we were really, really thrilled to, uh, that it won the vote to start with. <laughs> it went through a voting process and won, and then um, and that so many people enjoyed it, and that so many people picked it up as a result. Awesome. And I mean, you know, just to your point, you know, I feel like, well, at least in my experience, like the young queer Muslims I've met, I feel like they're the future of Islam. You know, like they're asking questions that one needs to ask. They're like, you know, they're sort of creating spaces where they feel comfortable to practice Islam, but they're also like asking questions that you do need to ask. For example, like, you know, the role of women within Islam, right? Like all those important questions that we need to ask in order to um, invite more people, uh, young, make Islam appealing to young people. For sure. Well, it was very lovely to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for your time. I know that you're really busy right now, so it's um, so great that we got to connect and that we had so many people join us tonight. That's awesome. Thank you, Elise, for joining us. And uh, we look forward to the next project, even if it is um, fiction. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and I uh, hope to see you next month. Thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks, you too. Bye. Bye.